Hey everyone, Erin here. So today's podcast is broken up into two segments. So you are listening to the first one now and you'll listen to the next one next week. My interview with Todd Norian was awesome. He is such a wonderful person. He's a tantrika. He is an internationally famous author, yoga teacher, and just a delight to talk to. I hope that you enjoy this very heartfelt and authentic podcast that we did together talking about the aspects of Tantra, Ashaya Yoga, and if you're local, we talk a little bit about his upcoming workshop at Thrive, December 1st through the 3rd. The early bird special expires October 1st if you want to sign up. It's only $2.99 for the whole weekend, super cheap. He has over 35 years of experience, so I hope that you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoyed recording it. Have a great day. Namaste. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Thrive Yoga Fit Transformational Coaching. This is Erin. So today I have a special guest for you, Todd Norian. Todd Norian is the founder of Ashaya Yoga, and Todd's style is one of precise biomechanical alignment infused with heart. He excels at making deep philosophical teachings accessible and relatable. With warmth and humor, Todd creates a sanctuary of sublime transformation in which students step into the power of their own heart. Hi, Todd. Hello, Aaron. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. uh, Soon we'll be seeing you in person at uh, Thrive Yoga Studio, which I'm super excited about and the students are excited about. Yeah, me too. Really looking forward to that. Yay, cool. Um, so um, some of the people listening to my podcast will know who you are, certainly, because I have lots of yogis that follow me, um, but others might not be as familiar. So um, I wanted to start by hopping into Tantra Yoga and Ashaya Yoga. So giving people just a little bit of background so maybe they can understand a little bit about you, how you teach and where you're coming from so great well uh, a little bit about tantra so one of the chapters right off in my book is it's not about sex so we can (laughs) just sort of get over that get over Uh, you know there's just so many different tantra being offered and there's many philosophies Um, the one that i teach really works with how to weave back together the dispersed parts of our self mm-hmm. into a meaningful integrated matrix of mm-hmm. relationship. So what does all that mean? Tantra means to weave. It, it also means a book, a scripture, even a practice. But this idea of uh, like a weaver's loom, so it looms, meaning that through the warp and the weft, which is like like these crossroads, it takes um, sort of the opposites and makes them complementary. So that's part of seeing our life, like all the contrast, how to make the contrast complementary. We're always looking for the place in the middle, like those intersections is really where our consciousness lives. So it's really about how to live in a balanced way to embrace the full spectrum of ourselves, which includes shadow and light. Mm. And so many practitioners today in yoga and just people in general have not like a really clear concept of what is the shadow or maybe that it doesn't even exist. Oh, I don't have any shadow, you know? And uh, I love what Deepak Chopra said once. He said, if you think you don't have a shadow, you must not be standing in the light. And it really sums up this idea of how not to be afraid of our shortcomings. In fact, the Tantra that I teach is really a path of fullness and a path of perfection, but it's a perfection that is so perfect, it includes imperfection. Mm. So full that it includes everything, including lack. And it gets very paradoxical like how can we hold both things at the same time fullness and lack of fullness at the same time and um so it it is to maybe i can say it this way the tantra i teach is how to live 
where you bring perfect acceptance to our perfect imperfections. And it's basically that. how to love ourselves. I could say, yeah, shy is the yoga of self-love. Mm. You know, because when we're in love with ourselves, we feel good inside. Um, we're able to be compassionate with ourselves and others. And the way we are in the world starts with the way that we are with ourselves. Hence the whole yoga practice, you know. Be the change you wish to see in the world. There's a famous quote from uh, Gandhi, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, that's the whole thing is to really, we look within ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And where am I out of relationship with myself? Where am I suppressing my shadow? Where am I judging myself? And mm -hmm. you know, like my, you know, I'm, I'm basically like, I'm my, I, I'm my worst critic, you know, like no one's criticizing me more than I'm criticizing myself. Sure. And so how to live in a way where I'm not so hard on myself. I'm, I have a little bit more acceptance in space. And then the other aspect of the Tantra is that um, the highest level of practice is self-knowledge, to be able to know myself. And to be able to reveal the truth that I am unbounded freedom seeking itself. Mm. And um, it's the whole idea that we are all walking around as gods and goddesses in disguise. Or as Hafiz has said, you know, we are the sun in drag. I love that. <laughs> We're all in drag. And the deal is, is that the, the divine energy is closer to us than our very own breath. Mm -hmm. It's hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the yoga practice is to learn how to recognize our divine nature and how to remember to surrender. Mm -hmm. It's a, a very beautiful path. And so many traditions really are down on the shadow and these imperfections like we have to transcend oh, what's up with that I, you know it's a it's it's they want a one trip ticket which is an up and out it's it's let's go to transcendence and tantra is really a round trip we're going to go up and out to seek the the highest freedom possible the highest bliss possible this ecstatic nectarian bliss that is our true nature only to come back and start to see it in the world and actually bring it into the world. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's different, like in, in Buddhism, they have also the Bodhisattva, right? Which is you, you get enlightened so that you don't have to come back, but you do come back to help other people transcend. And the Tantra tradition, which is also, there's Buddhist Tantra and, um, you know, Hindu Tantra. Mm -hmm. um, so there are parts of Buddhism that also align with the Tantra that I teach is this idea of being a householder yogi is just as valuable as being an ascetic or being a monk, you know, or being a renunciate yogi. There's not a superior inferior complex around mm -hmm. that. And it's very hard to do the renunciate path. I tried it, you know, and it just wasn't for me. I lived as a monk, you know, for yeah, nine years. Yeah, I said now. about, uh, you know, fasting and all these different, like, uh, you know, just ceremonies you would do. And I was like, wow, like, so to have your perspective from, you know, you've been through it. And then, you know, you found a different way that you're like, okay, well, this is inviting more of my fullness, the purna dat in, so that I can, you know, honor me. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I was uh, celibate for nine years, you know, living in this ashram, men and women were always separate. Meanwhile, the gay communi community was having a great time. But this <laughs> this was bet. in the 80s, you know, <laughs> when they were assigning rooms, okay, Jeff, you're going to be with Thomas and secretly they're going, yes, you know, and um, so there was really separation between, you know, men and women, we even ate mm -hmm. separately. Uh, we weren't supposed to socialize with the opposite sex. It was really, you know, in those traditions back then, that was the sort of strict ashram way. And um, you know, sure. many other, we've heard of other ashrams where it was like free sex for everybody. Um, so, but this particular path was very clear about this renunciate path. And, 
And the thing is, it's a powerful path. I got lots of value from, uh, you know, taking care of myself in all these ways, staying focused rather than being in relationship, which takes a lot of energy, emotional time and all that. No, no, it was really the focus was on the divine, was on me and God and basically the guru. And um, so there's a lot of value with that. And I think there are some people who are well suited for that path. So it's not like I'm diminishing that path, but it's very few people can do it because of how difficult that path really is. And then I wonder how many people are in that path who are also suppressing or they're in it because they're afraid of their own shadow or the, uh, reasons other than like the purest being drawn spiritually, you know, they're avo avoiding a, a piece of themselves. And that's a perfect segue into a question that I have. So yeah. I, um, I've, I've done quite a bit of shadow work and when you first do it, uh, for me, I was just like, Ooh, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's a, it's a lot. And you're looking like diving into places of shame and guilt and, and rage and these things that, you know, I had patterns that were coming up that I just didn't understand. And so I had to do a deep like swadhyaya dive into myself to try to understand like why, what's the good reason why this stuff keeps coming up. And for me, I found that, you know, my shadow actually has a lot of gifts like she helps me to be confident. She helps me to get things done. She helps me to channel some masculine energy and uh, co quite a few other things. And so how do you, like, how have you integrated your shadow and how do you, I guess, teach that with your method? Sure. Well, we start with how do you embrace the full spectrum shadow sure. and light and I think a key is, is acceptance. Acceptance is the key that opens our heart, you know? Mm. And I think, um, like I've done a lot of reading and studying and listening to Brene Brown, who has such a great segment on shame mm -hmm. and how like our perfectionism has its source in shame. Uh, many of our other issues like being stuck in an emotion or being stuck in anger or even in depression, goes back to a time in our childhood when we were shamed, when we were told we were unworthy or not enough, or we just interpreted those messages. And that was a lot of my, my background. You know, I talk mm -hmm. about in my book, like how even like in high school, you know, I, I was, um, my, my path is being a musician. Um, that's how I got into yoga. So I was always playing music in high school, but I was also athletic. So I wanted to try out for the football team. And, you know, I'm a sort of a scrawny, thin, you know, 130 pound musician. And I remember training, it was to get onto the uh, freshman high school football team. And for three weeks in August, we would train. I was black and blue all over. And I remember going head to head with these bullies, basically, who weighed like 230 pounds, you know, like twice as much as me. And I really just got uh, pulverized. And at the end of that, they were going to pick who made it on the team. So we all stood in line. They called all the names of the people that made the team. And there were three of us whose names weren't called. And yeah, I was just I devastated. I, I, I put so much energy into it and I got wounded doing it. Like I had all my bruises to show and I really wanted to be on the team. And the coach just didn't say anything to us. You know, he just basically said, all right, 10 laps around the field, turned and left. That was it. There was no like, thanks for trying out, try out again next year. You guys really did a great job. Or let's hear a round of applause for the effort that these guys put in, you know, there was nothing no, of some sort, right? <laughs> some acknowledgement, maybe. <laughs> so, you know, I say in my book also that um, we are left with the meaning we give to the experience we're having. It's not the experience itself. It's the meaning we assign to it. Sure. We are meaning-making machines. Now, that meaning comes from our samskaras and from our imprints. And they can sometimes come from shame. So I took that to mean 
that I was less than. I felt really bad and I felt like I just wasn't enough because that was my history leading up to that point. Other, other people may have said, oh, who cares? All right, I'll try again next, next year. I don't need any acknowledgement outside, you know? And some of them might have said, oh, I'm so glad I didn't get on the team. So we bring our history to every experience we have. Yes. So um, in seeing that, I've had to really build inside of myself acceptance for being enough and to really see the strength of what I can actually bring forward and not to sort of judge myself on my performance mm. and not to listen to what other people are saying, like take criticism to heart and make it mean like I'm a bad person, but how to really open to it, affirm myself, esteem myself. And, and then, you know, when I'm more sort of put together, when I've woven myself back together, with a lot of love and acceptance and you know affirmations like i love and improve approve of myself just as i am mm -hmm. and this one which i love i am a one of a kind you know, <laughs> um i am talented people like me like there's all these things that to, to help me replace um sort of the negative talk mm -hmm. and usually we walk around with at least one voice in there that's doubting us all yeah. the time. All the time, yeah. And some people have a group of voices and I call all those group of negative voices, I call them the itty bitty shitty committee. <laughs> but it puts it into perspective. <laughs> and to the extent that I can give myself the love and acceptance and really see myself with eyes of truth. You know, I don't wanna like, you know, um, build myself up um, inauthentically. But really, when we look, we see that we do have value, you know, and to kind of hold that up to the light, and then stand strong in that. And to your uh, comment about, you said that sometimes you feel like your shadow actually is offering you a gift. And it's so true. I offered a course with one of my uh, tantric scholar uh, friends and teachers. He actually did one of the forwards in my book, Douglas Brooks. Douglas Brooks, yeah, I saw that. And we did a course together called um, Stand in the Gift of Your Wound. Mm. And it's this idea that when you open to see the shadow and the hurt and the wounding that's there, it's there for a really good reason. And it's yeah. there to actually give you a gift. Mm. And um, so I think approaching our life in that way and also the belief that everything in life is for our awakening gives a very spiritual perspective on life that life is not trying to cut us down. Like when we get challenges, it's not because we're bad. Right. Challenges never come to squash us down. They only come when we're ready to rise up when we're ready to get stronger, when we're ready to bring forward the courage, the confidence it takes to overcome these shortcomings. Mm -hmm. I, I like to say challenges only come when you're ready. They only come because you're ready for a promotion <laughs> to go higher. So yes. that stumbling blocks turn into stepping stones. Mm -hmm. Obstacles become doorways of opportunity. Yeah. And what you think is a setback is really a setup for a comeback. Mm -hmm. And to view life in this way, like it really helped me progress spiritually because I was spending less and less time in guilt and shame and mm -hmm. regret. And I started to really become present to the reality that is divine, that's always here, but behind a veil. And what is yoga if it's not to help remove that veil? And I guide a meditation where we see this, that we're behind, like look behind your eyes and see a veil, let it be um, oblique at first. And then as we soften, it becomes translucent so it's cloudy, but you can see a little light through it. 
Mm. And then as you go deeper, it becomes transparent. Mm. It's like you're looking through glass, trying to see reality without the veil. Mm. And then ultimately imagine there's no veil and you Mm. just are there in the naked expression of your eyes and the eyes of grace looking back. And it's, it fills me with energy just to like think about that again. Well, it's, as you were saying it, it kind of felt like you were doing that. You were embodying it, which is <laughs> like, you know, that you're, you're a yoga charya. Like you, you walk the walk, you, you live the lifestyle. And just mm-hmm. talking with you, I think it's clear people who see this video or hear this audio, it's like, mm-hmm. in, even in the resonance of your voice, Todd, I can tell that you have this deep acceptance of yourself besides all the beautiful things that you're saying. But you know, because you accept yourself, not only does that make you a powerful teacher for others and, and a light because you're recognizing your light and your dark and integrating them, which is beautiful. Um, but, you know, it gives it gives permission and and shows a path for others to do the same because, you know, some some people and, and especially in the yoga community, you know, shaming themselves for having desires for. Um, their chakras being out of alignment or, you know, that they, they feel, um, you know, not, not quite as um, uh, worthy, I guess, as, as someone that they perceive is more like righteous than them, which is just such a, a block. So I love how you said you're taking these stumbling blocks and making them stepping stones and yeah. having that shift in perspective. And because you have the space within you because of your practices you're able to do that, provide that and, and teach from that space. It's just like mm. amazing. And like in, in your book here, uh, so it's Tantra Yoga Journey to the Unbreakable Wholeness, which I have it right here. Um, it's such a beautiful blend of your personal stories weaved in with the philosophy of yoga. And then it's like the stories are you living from that space. So you're teaching from the experience, which is just mm. chef's kiss. <laughs> well, thank you so much and yeah. you know i i i really believe like everyone has a sacred story to tell and i've never had a conversation with any human being that wasn't so intriguing and deep and rich when you really sit down with someone and ask them to share about their lives like who are you and you know how have you grown in this life so yeah, I encourage everyone to write their memoir. It's as, <laughs> as, as it's as much a gift for the world as as it is for us writing it because it it um, for me it created so much uh, like some completion and some clarity to really uh, examine the different experiences that have been offered to me in my life and see how I've interpreted them. And not all of them were interpreted healthy. I've made so many mistakes. Mm. You know, I talk about the betrayal of, of, you know, dedicating my whole life to a particular path and a particular teacher, only to find out that the teacher was living a duplicitous life, which we hear about all the time. And the scandal came out and he had been having sex with all, you know, many of the female students while making all of us practice celibacy. Um, and I know a lot of friends of mine who actually fell in love and had to leave the ashram because they broke sort of the celibacy vows. Um, so to be in that position and then to be lied to, it's such a, my heart was just completely shattered. But when I look back at that, I see in a way how I contributed to that because of the meaning I gave to it. And I just gave my power away to a person you know, which I guess it's kind of like infatuation, you know, when you're infatuated, you just like overlook things and yeah, exactly. We, we sort of fall into it deeper, Um, but it was a really good learning for me how to appreciate someone's gifts, um, but not give my power over to them because I still want to be able to learn from everybody and everything in life. But um, so that that took me a couple times to learn because it happened again. I was 17 years in one method. And then I said, oh, my God, I got to get out of this because it's uh, I was betrayed. And then I did it again for another 15 years. And the same kind of thing 
happened where the community fell apart due to misconduct at the top. And when I look back, it's really because of those two experiences is why I got enough of the sort of the courage, we could say, to brand Ashaya and do my own yoga. I said, okay, enough of this. I'm going to bring a yoga into the world that really reflects my values and the value of the essence and authenticity of yoga itself. Because the yoga was good, like in all those methods. It's sure. just in those methods, you know, and everybody's a human being. So I have, I have done a lot of deep work on this and I have forgiveness and everything. Um, but I have a very strong, healthy boundary that someone who is not doing their deep inner work to embrace the shadow and who continues to lie and shame other people to maintain the mm -hmm. power that they have, that's, I'm, I'm staying clear of that, you know? Yeah. Um, so it really is, the Tantra is the embrace of both shadow and light and how to live as best we can in our perfect imperfections to keep moving towards the light and to stay open to grow. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to support the podcast and if it's helping you, please consider writing a review. You can go to iTunes or Google Play, go into the search bar and type in Thrive Yoga Fit Transformational Coaching, scroll down and you can leave a review. This helps other people to find me as well as bumps us up in the search ratings. Also, this podcast is sponsor free, so that means we don't receive anything for doing it. If you feel so inclined and this podcast is helping to support you and you want to return the favor and help to support any production costs of the podcast, feel free to give a donation to a Venmo link, Thrive Yoga Fit or PayPal, Aaron at AaronCoach.com. If you don't have the means, don't worry about it. We're not going anywhere. You're all good. But if you would like to give back, you can give back in those ways. Thank you so much. Namaste.